All right. Good morning, everybody. Today, we're going to be answering your top questions, including questions like why you might not be losing weight or experiencing a weight loss plateau or what satiety even is. So these are questions that we see all the time in the community, and we wanted to actually just go through some of the top ones and really dive deep into those answers. So we're going to be doing that in today's live stream. Um, for those of you who are just tuning in, we're in week three of the spring intermittent fasting challenge. So this is the last week. If you still want to just check out the details for it, you can find the link down description below. Um, these are the tools, the strategies that I personally use to help me lose 20 pounds with my postpartum weight loss journey without counting calories or feeling hungry. Um, but anyway, so today we're going to be answering your top questions. We'll also be answering a few questions from the live um, chat. So if you want to put four question marks before and after your question, we'll get to those at the end. But I actually have a special guest today. We have Katie, who has been on the a and team for over three years. Um, if you've ever emailed us, if you've talked with us in um, the private Facebook group. You've probably talked to Katie. She's amazing. She's like the nicest person ever. She's also been part of the a and team for over three years, um, but she was first an a and peep, like one of the OG, OG a and peeps, then a client, and then now part of the a and team. So she knows a lot um, about everything. <laughs> um, she's the one who's often answering your guys' questions within the private Facebook group. So I actually asked her to come on so that we could answer some of your guys' common questions. Um, and really dive deep into those. So I'm going to bring Katie on right now. Hi, Katie. Hi, everyone. So glad to be here with you today. Yeah. So Katie um, is, like I mentioned, she's been part of the AN team for over three years. She actually just celebrated her three-year AN team. Yeah. <laughs> That's um, yeah. So uh, Katie actually compiled these questions for me. Um, these are ones that you said pop up all the time, right? Yeah. Yeah. We, I mean, I get... We get a lot of questions um, every day, which is really cool because I learn from your all's questions too. Um, so yeah, but these are just some of the most common questions I see just about every day. I'm getting at least one of these six questions asked. Okay, perfect. I'm going to bring these up so we can just dive straight into the first one. So I wanted to put this one first because I, this is like the cornerstone of everything we talk about. Um, but what is eating until satiated and am I doing it right? This is a big question because it really is a shift from what people might have previously used in the past. In fact, probably about like 99.9% .9 of people um, have used in the past for weight loss or wellness goals. So we do things a lot different here where we focus on satiety rather than just simple like eating less, moving more. Um, satiety or eating until satiated is where you're actually eating the right types of foods to raise your satiety hormones. There's a bunch of different ones, but the common ones are peptide YY and CCK. Um, and when we actually eat enough of the certain right types of foods, so what we talk about on my channel in the programs of protein, fat, and fiber, uh, it literally tells our brain and our body that we're full, we're satisfied, and we don't need to eat. In research, this is called ad libitum eating, which just means eating as much as you want. Um, and that's essentially what we're aiming for with the programs and um, within the Facebook group, with the community, with the um, all of our YouTube videos, is helping you to learn how to feel satisfied and eat the right types of foods to feel satisfied so you can achieve your goals without having to restrict or um, not give yourself the right types of nourishment that can lead to issues down the line because that unfortunately happens all the time. Um, but what this actually feels like is feeling satisfied but not overly full. It's not what, what eating until satiety is not is trying to actively limit yourself from eating or rather causing yourself to eat less. Um, you should feel satisfied and not feel the urge to eat for about four hours. What satiety is not feeling excessively full. So this feeling of feeling really, really full or that bloaty feeling or just feeling like, oh, I ate way too much. I feel sluggish. Um, oftentimes you might feel like bloated from it. Uh, this is from eating too much of the wrong types of foods. So the foods that cause us to eat well beyond our body's needs, specifically like the ultra processed fats and carbs, especially in combination. Um, oftentimes you're not eating enough of the actual like protein or fat, uh, specifically protein actually, to feel to uh, raise those satiety hormones enough to feel satisfied for about four hours. So you'll feel initially like really full and just like ugh, not feeling good. And then you'll be hungry within two hours. Even if you still feel physically full, you might feel like ravenously hungry or just even like I could eat within two hours. That's not satiety. That's a sign that you have not eaten enough of the right types of foods and likely eaten too much of the wrong types of foods. 
Um, that's just kind of like my sciencey breakdown, but I forget, you got something that you wanted to say on this, right, Katie? Yeah, I personally wanted to say, like in my experience with eating to satiety is, you know, we're we're given things in like serving sizes, like especially prepackaged foods. I think we kind of, or if you've ever followed a diet in the past, you think, well, this is my serving. This is what it looks like. And then you think, well, I'm still kind of hungry. And like your intuition is to go and eat more food because you don't feel satiated. But psychologically, you're like, well, this, this should be enough. And I feel like we don't trust ourselves sometimes to eat to satiety, um, whether that's from past dieting experience or honestly just not knowing what a serving even looks like to feel satiated for our own bodies. Yeah. And that's a really good point because something that I'll see often in emails or even with clients, people will be like, I feel like I'm doing this wrong because I feel not hungry. <laughs> right. Like you, you see that a lot in the Facebook group as well. Oh my gosh. The amount of questions is I like they think like I'm overeating because I feel good. I, and I'll, that's the comment I'll see. I feel great, but I'm not hungry. What am I doing wrong? And I'm like, that's you're that that's you're doing it right. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. a, you, it, it's so counterintuitive to traditional diet advice is how I think about it. Right. Right. Um, and yeah. And something else with that, um, totally lost my train of thought. I was about to say something. Hopefully I'll come back in a second. <laughs> Okay. Well, the second one, um, experiencing weight gain or a plateau, any tips? Um, I broke this up into two different sections because they're kind of the same, but um, they, they have different tools that you can build upon or different assessments that you'll want to um, gather. So let's first talk about weight gain. The very first thing, and I'm not sure, can you hear my chickens? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're very loud. Okay, so the very first thing for whether it's weight gain or plateau is to use the right measurements. I never recommend a traditional scale because a scale tells you just overall weight. It doesn't tell you if you're losing body fat, if you're losing um, muscle, if you're losing bone, or if you just experience like water retention. Um, so if you're just looking at the scale, it could really cause you to overcorrect in a wrong direction, cause you to really restrict your food and therefore lose more muscle mass and lower your metabolism, cause more of that yo-yo dieting. So that's why I never recommend um, using the scale. So first, make sure you're using the right measurements. Don't use a scale. Use something like an in-body, which is my personal favorite. I actually have my results here somewhere. I was just, oh yeah. So in-bodies, um, they give you a little printout like this and it breaks down um, like what your, obviously what your weight is, but also your skeletal muscle mass, your body fat mass, um, body fat percentage. And it even breaks down like the lean mass within different parts of your body, like your upper body, lower body, your core. Uh, you can often get these at the gym, which is really nice. Um, some will have it just included with your gym fee. Some you pay like $15, $19 for uh, a scan. And usually you want to do it like once every six months or so, or six weeks or so um, to actually get some good data. But this would be more what you want to keep track of to make sure that you're not um, basing your changes off of incorrect data. So from there, like, let's say, assuming that you are seeing that, okay, my body fat has gone up, my muscle mass maybe is going down or hasn't changed. Um, so what's going on? What, what could we address? First of all, is the protein intake. I feel like I see this question a lot, um, actually, for weight gain, where people start intermittent fasting, um, like they'll start doing like a 16 hour fast, but then they don't actually change what they're eating, or they just cut out a meal. And as a result, then that's going to cause like either initial weight loss and then weight gain from that metabolism um, dropping down or just you never change your meals in the first place. So you're not really going to get the benefits of intermittent fasting at all. So assessing the protein intake, remember, we still need to focus on the types of foods we're eating during the eating window, um, both quality and quantity with protein. So making sure you're eating adequate amounts for your body, really at least 30 grams uh, per meal for most people should do the trick, um, but also quality. I talk so much about that on my channel. I just did another blog post, I think last week, right, Katie, on like the protein list. Yes. Um, so that's a good one to check out if you need some help with that. But that is a very big factor for helping to regulate satiety, make sure that you're not going to eat too much of the wrong types of foods that will work against your goals and make sure that you're not going to have a dip in metabolism. Uh, another one, assessing the addictive food intake. So even if you are eating enough protein, but you're still eating foods that are 
ultra processed and very addictive, then that could bypass the natural satiety cues that your body is trying to send you and cause you to eat more and more and more well beyond your body's needs because of that addictive spiral. So um, these would be common things that are combining like ultra processed carbs and fats. So you can think of like cereals, a lot of baked goods, um, like ice cream is another common example. Eating these foods on the daily can make it really hard to uh, actually moderate based on your satiety cues. Um, another thing to take a look at are the low glycemic load foods. So I don't count carbs. I have not found that actually to be very helpful. Instead, I like to focus on the uh, carbohydrate quality. Um, forget what the title of that video was. Do you remember, Katie? I think it literally was, I don't count carbs. This is what I do. It is. That is. I was going to say, I'll look and see if I can. Yeah. I think so that's a good one um, for you guys to check out. If you um, have done these first two things you're, or you're using the right measurements, you assess your protein take, you're um, not eating the foods that are very addictive. I would take a look at focusing on the low glycemic load foods. So I believe it is my video um, is titled, I don't count carbs. Don't carbs. Yep. Okay. Cool. Yep. Uh, I also have a blog post on it. So if you are more visual and you want like a list, then you could just type into Google like Autumn Bates glycemic load chart and that one will pop right up. Um, this last portion is very important though, considering time to heal the metabolism. So if you have been chronically dieting your whole life or you've um, dieted, gone out, dieted, gone out, like you've had this yo-yo experience, uh, it is very likely you've experienced a lot of muscle loss and it just takes time for the metabolism to heal, for the muscle mass to heal as well, to actually come back and bounce back. Um, so it could take a little bit of time to actually start seeing results if you have had that history of yo-yo dieting, but it's important to really emphasize the quality of the nutrients that you're eating and getting that protein, especially if you fall in this category, because it's it's even more important. You, your body is craving more of those nutrients even more before it can actually help with the body recomposition goals. Um, before I go into plateau, I, I forget, did you have something that you wanted to say on that section? Actually, I do want to just bring up something on the addictive food intake, because even if you have, you are someone that you are incorporating lower glycemic load, like fruits, for example, or you're thinking, well, I've cut sugar and now I might add in like some stevia or monk fruit. And I, I'm just bringing this up because I've personally had this problem and we've worked on it together. Um, but we don't think about how hyper palatable non-nutritive sweeteners are and how that can impact what we crave later mm -hmm. in the day or even feel hungry later in the day. So like just recently, it's really hard to be that honest with yourself, I think sometimes. But like I was using unsweetened nut, nut pods in my coffee just for time. I've been, I have had a baby as well. And so, you know, I'm, I'm just pouring like a couple tablespoons in. And I just recently this week decided I really want a cup of keto coffee. And it is amazing how like I notice a difference like later in the day, like not feeling hungry, as hungry, like as soon, just from not having that sweet taste, if that makes sense. So yeah. for me personally, we have to we have to figure out what addictive even means sometimes, even if you have cut sugar, there can still be tweaks that you need to make that might make you overeat something in general or eat more often. Yeah. Yeah. The addictive, there's really two different categories of addictive foods. There's the foods that are designed to be addictive. Um, you could think of like the hyper palatable foods that are like just all in that middle, those middle aisles of the grocery store. Pretty much all of those are going to be those hyper palatable um, foods that are made from ultra processed carbs and fats. And that's designed to hijack our satiety and make it so that we will eat more than what our body actually needs. But um, there's also the trigger foods where for each person that's going to be different for some people, they could be like a really good high quality food that's uh, packed with nutrients and um, supports other people's goals. But maybe for somebody else, it's very hard to stop eating it. I always give the example of peanut butter because mm -hmm. For me, like I could have a tablespoon of peanut butter and I don't need more peanut butter. My husband could eat the entire jar of peanut butter. <laughs> so for him, like he knows he just can't have a jar of peanut butter out. Like if he's going to use it, he needs to put it in a smoothie or he needs to use a set amount um, that he's going to put on his protein waffle, for example. Um, so it's just finding like what those foods are for you as well so that you know how to either adjust it um, set your own individual serving sizes for it if that's helpful or maybe if it is just such a triggering food for you maybe just keeping it out of sight out of mind yep. um so plateau uh so plateau would be 
assuming you're already looking at the right measurements, um, because again, remember, we want to make sure that you're not just looking at the scale. So a plateau would be that you are not seeing body fat go down anymore, assuming that's your goal, um, and you're seeing everything stay the same. One of the best tools after all of these other ones that we've just discussed, so all of those from the weight gain category, I'd first take a look at for the plateau, uh, but then would be to add on resistance training. This in combination with eating the high quality proteins with using intermittent fasting, it can be such a game changer. Um, I've shared Kristen's story in the past. She's one of the AM peeps where she did the 21 day intermittent fasting program, which is what we're following right now for the spring challenge. Um, and she had lost weight. She had achieved a lot of her goals, but then she still had like about 10 or 15 pounds that she was looking to achieve. And she was at this plateau. And so the community actually within the private Facebook group had told her like, hey, have you tried out the workouts within the 21 day program yet? Like that's been a game changer for me. So she finally incorporated that and was able to massively break through her plateau. I think it was lose an additional 15 pounds and with body recomposition. Um, so adding on that resistance training, it, it could be whatever form you enjoy. Um, but there is a um, included workout program within the 21 day intermittent fasting program. So if you have that, you can absolutely check that out and use that as well. But using that, I really strongly uh, recommend taking a look at that category because it's one that's often overlooked, um, obviously, because we're basic, we're primarily a nutrition channel, um, but the resistance training component is such a great additional section to add on to just build upon your results. What would you say about that, Katie? I think you had your, because you're kind of in that portion right now as well. I am. I am. So I am six months postpartum and then I really had to approach like my fitness, like just straight from the beginning um, as a, like view it as a, as a beginner, I should say. Um, and I have slowly, and this comes back to your point about not using the scale is I haven't necessarily seen like a scale loss per se, but I feel my body changing and I have been adding in strength because I just feel like that's so foundational in how we move um, throughout our day. So I just decided, you know what, we're going to focus on strength and um, just like Kristen's experience, like you're seeing body changes versus just seeing weight changes. Um, yeah. And so if I wasn't, and for me personally, I'm just doing progress photos and, you know, over time, and there's just little changes you can see that has been helpful for me. But if I were to have not done that and just only focused on what the scale is saying, like literally it hasn't moved in probably two months, but I'm progressively getting stronger. I'm able to lift heavier and, and do exercises that I actually couldn't even do pre-pregnancy because I wasn't strength training um, in general. So it's just, it makes a huge difference, not just in weight loss, but how you feel, how you move through the day. And then I feel like the stronger you get, the more you move. <laughs> it's really yeah. strange how that works, but I have had that personal experience. So, yeah. And that's, um, so if you guys didn't see my video, I think it was like five clear signs you're burning uh, fat, not muscle. That's a good one I would check out. So you could just know what the signs are that you're at least headed in that right direction if you don't have access to something like the in-body um, because it does help you to see the cues of what to look out for to, to make sure that you are truly burning body fat and not muscle mass because that's what you want for those long-term results and making sure that you're actually nourishing your body as well. Then I put as a last bit here, don't just eat less, move more, because that will just ultimately result in more muscle loss. There's so many studies showing that just this typical strategy results in a significant amount of muscle loss, a lower uh, metabolism. It can um, cause your body to lose more bone mass as well, bone density, um, lead to issues of possibly even osteoporosis down the line. So you want to make sure that you're nourishing your body with the right types of foods that raise satiety, which goes back to that first section that we talked about on our approach to satiety and not just eat less, move more. Okay. Next up, we have struggling with avoiding snacks. So if you guys are kind of new to my channel, um, or maybe this is your first challenge, or maybe you're just tuning in for the first time, it's important to understand my stance on snacks. I've, I've found that uh, from best for best results for body recomposition, as well as for gut health, which is really an important thing as well, uh, to stick to meals and not snacks. Now, the problem that most people have when they are struggling with avoiding snacks, it's really like a couple of different things here. So I put a couple of different potential things you could um, assess for yourself. First is you're likely not eating enough protein. That is the biggest one. Most people are 
very low in their protein intake, even if they think that they're eating enough protein, I suggest taking an honest assessment of what protein you're actually eating. Make sure you familiar familiarize yourself with what those high quality proteins are, um, because you can't, for most people, you can't just like passively eat food and eat enough protein for your body's needs. It needs to really be pr a protein focus um, to make sure you're hitting that protein first and then eating enough of everything else. Um, so I'm not going to go too far into that um, because we will be talking about that more in just a second as well. And we already talked about it quite a bit earlier, but another potential issue, which isn't one that you might think about, but it's drinking too much coffee. This is another potential cause of something else we'll talk about in a bit as well. Um, but I found that when people eat too much or drink too much coffee, and I've seen this for myself too, it makes it so with your first meal, you aren't as hungry because caffeine is such an appetite suppressant that it can make it so you just eat less than what your body would need at that first meal. So as a result, once that caffeine wears off, then once you get to like two hours after your first meal, you your body is finally recognizing that it hasn't hit those satiety hormones and you suddenly feel ravenous. <laughs> I've experienced this myself. Um, Katie, I think you said you've experienced I've this. Been there. Oh yeah, I've been there. Yeah, it's easy to do, especially if you're like, I'll just have a second cup of coffee. It won't hurt. <laughs> I've done that. Um, so make sure you're assessing your caffeine intake uh, because that could be causing you to eat too little at your first meal and then ultimately um, crave snacks later on. But then the last other main one that could be happening if you're struggling with avoiding snacks is it could just be a sugar tooth concern. If you find that you're not actually hungry, but you're just craving food. Now, the difference between hunger and craving, um, craving is usually you're craving something specific and it's often carb or salt based. Um, so if it's like a carby base, like you're craving crackers or pretzels or chips or um, some type of like sugar of some sort, then you probably just have your, your, you might be stuck in that like addictive spiral that we talked about earlier. So this is where having a clean slate approach could be helpful. Uh, I have the seven day detox program um, where it eliminates those added sugars to help with um, assessing that clean slate and getting that clean slate. But it can help to just reset cravings so that you now can just feel satisfied and not have those cravings for snacks in between meals, but actually listen to true hunger. Um, I think you had something else you wanted to say about that as well. Yeah, I had noticed, um, especially while uh, coming just here recently, um, as I'm adjusting out of my postpartum period, was like, I would be so I was focused on the protein. I was like, I've, I've nailed it. I've got this down. But I would start to find myself like wanting to graze on something salty in the afternoons. And that's when I realized like, oh, I need more electrolytes um, mm. versus just grabbing the salty snack. So sometimes, too, if you're someone who maybe doesn't have the sweet tooth, but you 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 might snack on nuts. That was that was kind of my big wanting something salty snack or if you like the chips or, you know, anything that just you think, oh, I want that salt you want salt, <laughs> you know, it was like, that was my cue of like, okay, well maybe I need to, to front load my day with a little bit more electrolytes. And for me in the fasting period um, was super helpful. Yeah. You yeah. About in your programs extensively. And it's just something small that sometimes we forget how important it is. Just if you miss it and that becomes the habit, then for mm -hmm. me, I just wasn't adding, for example, like salt to the ACV sipper. Um, so making sure I had the salt or, even an element like right with my breakfast, because I usually use the flavored options that seem to fix that need for salt, like at like 3 p.m. for me, or even like have that energy crash at three. Yeah. And especially if you um, are using the types of like actual food nutrition strategies that we talked about, which is more whole food based or minimally processed based, uh, you're not eating a lot of salt as it is. You're adding salt to your food with like the various cooking methods, but processed foods are so much higher in salt that you don't really need to be adding salt in. You're getting a lot of salt from processed foods, but from whole foods or minimally processed foods, even if you are salting to taste, you're still probably not eating enough salt and salt is very important. Um, again, if you are focusing on more of the whole food approach. So that is a good point. Your body could just be craving salt and looking for some type of salty food to get that additional salt. Okay, next up, uh, tips for high protein plant-based. So this one, um, you know, there's not a high percentage of people who are plant-based, but it is really important to understand how to actually eat high quality protein from a plant-based diet if you are plant-based. So 
first things first, we need to make sure that you're focused on the quality first, because technically there is a little bit of protein in a lot of different things. Like there's a little bit of protein in broccoli. There's a little bit of protein in like all these various leafy greens, but it's not really a high quality protein. It's very low diaz, which is a measurement of protein quality. So it's not to say that you can't have or follow a plant-based diet and still eat high quality proteins. You just really need to be extra focused on those quality sources and know what they are and how much you need. So these are some of the highest quality ones I have listed here. Uh, there's tempeh, which is a fermented soy product. I recommend this over tofu because it is fermented. So it helps to reduce a lot of the anti-nutrients that are in soy. Um, tempeh is also going to be a lot more dense in protein. So you don't have to physically eat so much of it. So for about 30 grams of complete protein, you only need about five ounces of tempeh. And I think for tofu, even the firm option, I think it's about nine and a half ounces. So it's nearly double, which it's, I think those bricks are about 14 ounces. So you're eating like two thirds of those big bricks of tofu to hit one meal's amount of protein. Um, but edamame tofu is technically one that you could use as well. Plant-based protein powder, um, make sure you're choosing a high quality one so that it's not causing some gut distress because that is a common issue with a lot of plant-based protein powders. Uh, high protein plant-based yogurt. So there are yogurts like Kite Hill that does have a Greek style plant-based um, yogurt. So you can always check that out too. Now chickpeas and yellow split peas technically are going to be the higher diaz um, proteins from a plant-based perspective, although they do have a lot more carbohydrates to protein content. So if you're carb sensitive, then these probably aren't good options for you. Um, but if you wanted to like add these on as an additional protein, maybe not the primary one, like you're adding it on to tofu, for example, um, or along with the yogurt, if you're having like a Mediterranean style yogurt bowl, then you could do that to help bump up the overall protein of the meal. Now you also can technically combine proteins, but it's also important to understand it's not as easy as just like combined beans and rice. So you need to um, make sure that you're combining them. If you're going to go about it this route and not use these other proteins that I mentioned, that you are using the very specific studied ratios. I have a full blog post on this, but I also have them on the next slide that I'll show um, so that you are actually getting enough high quality protein to support your body. Uh, it, these also will typically result in a very higher carbohydrate intake. So it's just something to consider if you are carb sensitive, especially. But this is directly taken from a study where they actually tested different sources of plant-based proteins and their uh, combined diaz score. Um, so you can see it's very calculated. It's not like, oh, just like eat some beans and rice. You have to eat a certain percentage of each of these different types of proteins. Like let's take this first one, for example. Um, if you're to have combined fava bean, corn, and soy, you need to have 10% of that come from fava bean, 20% of that come from uh, corn and 70% of that come from soy to get a combined diet score of 85%. So 85 would be a pretty good diet score for plant-based. Now you can see this whole list of different options. So soy and oat, oat, uh, oat lupin, soy, um, fava bean, corn, potato. So there's different ones that you can combine in different um, percentages. It's, it's important if you're going to go about that route, you at least are using those percentages. Otherwise, I would rather just stick to the more whole food options that are naturally going to be a lot higher in protein, like the tempeh, edamame, um, tofu, or you can add on with like the plant-based protein powder, um, higher protein plant-based yogurt, and then even using the chickpeas or yellow split peas. Now, Katie and I were also talking about like if you are open to adding in other type of like more vegetarian options, um, then like uh, using eggs, using various dairy products does open up a lot of different options for you where you have more types of proteins um, where you aren't as limited. So you wanted to mention something about that? Um, I just, exactly what you said is, uh, I know for me, like even if you are someone that maybe doesn't tolerate um, or, or you're wanting to add on, but you don't know where to start and you, you're worried about your tolerance for adding in eggs or dairy, like you can start really small. Um, for like, I was vegan for a couple years in my prior history and, um, really needed to add in some, uh, animal based protein. So for me, starting with just egg whites was really a simple way because you, it, you're not really changing. It's easy to just incorporate it into how you already eat. Um, so if that's something like you're interested, like, but you don't know how to get your feet wet, egg, like using eggs was, was really great for me because I'm dairy sensitive. But if you're not, then like. 
I know you have a, a recipe, I think, for halloumi, like on salads. Mm -hmm. Like there's just so many good ways to bring in quality dairy, your your yeah. protein powder, like just switching your protein powder to use a, the whey protein isolate instead of the plant-based option, if that works for your body. There's just yeah. easy ways to kind of like tiptoe into expanding and giving you more options for protein. Yeah. And if you are starting with dairy, I actually had somebody uh, DM me this on Instagram asking about like how to start to incorporate dairy. They weren't plant-based, but they um, like had avoided dairy for a long time because they thought it was going to cause acne for them, which I have a full video on. If you want to check out all of those details, you can type in like Autumn Bates Dairy on YouTube and that video should pop right up. Um, but I would recommend starting with the lowest lactose options because those are going to be the easiest to digest and break down. That's what I personally did. So that would be like Greek yogurt, skier, obviously whey isolate protein powder. That's why I made my protein powder 100% whey isolate because it is the lowest lactose form of whey. Um, various cheeses. Cottage cheese actually took a little bit of time for me to build up a tolerance to um, from the lactose perspective, even though it is lower in lactose, but now I can eat like a tub of it and be fine, <laughs> which I kind of do every single day. Um, but yeah, I'd start with the lowest lactose options and then you could always steadily scale up from there. And those are great quality sources of protein. Okay, uh, perimenopause and menopause weight loss tips. So um, Katie mentioned to me that this is like a lot of people are asking about this. I've noticed this myself as well, um, like in Instagram, um, people reaching out to me asking like, how do they go about perimenopause or menopause um, with the program or what do they need to specifically focus on? Some of the, it's important to understand like what the um, things that are changing, how that will impact goals. So uh, there's like three main things that we need to factor in. First of all, is that there is an increase in muscle loss. How quickly we will lose muscle is accelerated as we age. Um, accelerated bone loss, which also is a big concern, um, and then increased insulin resistance. These three things make how you approach your meals change quite a bit. Um, but the main, like the main tools that we want to use is first of all, again, broken record here, but upping your protein intake and quality. No, it, during perimenopause or menopause, um, there's probably no other more important time when you should really be focusing on protein quality, getting the highest diet as um, proteins that you could possibly fit into your diet um, because protein needs are so much higher between the increased muscle loss as well as the accelerated bone loss. So to help from, you know, from a body recomposition perspective, but also for long-term health perspective as well, it is so important to make sure that you're getting quality sources of protein. There's been studies showing that, um, like adults about, I think it's either 50 or 55 and older, tend to have about 25% higher protein needs than, the, than their younger age self. So people often think like, oh, like when I'm younger is when I need more protein, so I'm more active. Actually, it's when we're older, because when we're older, it's when we have a even faster loss of that muscle and bone, which both rely on protein. Um, so starting resistance training strategically, if you haven't done this in the past, then I would maybe either work with a trainer or just start with body weight exercises and then slowly scale up from there. Um, but this helps us obviously with stopping the muscle loss and even maybe putting on a little bit of muscle, which helps from a metabolism perspective, body recomposition perspective, but again, from heart health perspective and bone health perspective. Um, so adding in the resistance training combined with the protein, you need both of those, can't do one or the other. Resistance training also sends that signal to our bones to not lose as much bone mass, which is great. And then don't do a ton of cardio. I think for a long time, even up until like 10 years ago, because when I was in college, pretty much everybody, especially women um, would just be on the treadmills. Um, so I think that was like the thought process is that you just run a lot and burn a lot of calories and that's how you're going to lose weight. This is a great way to lose a lot of muscle mass if you're just focusing on cardio. Cardio can be great from a heart health perspective and adding that in strategically, but you need to balance that out with proper resistance training. So don't, if you're perimenopause, menopause, regardless of your age, really, but if you are looking to achieve a weight loss goal that's sustainable and done in a healthy way, do not just add on a lot of cardio because that is not going to help preserve your muscle mass and therefore could lead to further metabolism issues down the line, or even not even down the line, literally in like a month. Mm -hmm. um, focus on the most nutrient dense, low to medium glycemic carbs. So those 
low to medium glycemic load carbs are typically where we're going to have the most nutrients anyway. When we get more into the high glycemic load carbohydrates, they can have a bigger impact on our blood sugar level and therefore make it so it's a lot easier to be hungry faster. Um, but they also tend to be lower in nutrient quality. So in general, but you know, even if you are in that perimenopause, menopause state, when you have that increased insulin resistance or likely increased insulin resistance, we really want to focus on the most nutrient dense sources of carbohydrates um, of fruits and veggies that are going to provide you the most bang for your carbohydrate buck. Uh, so you can check out again that blog post chickens laying another egg in the background. Um, but you can check out that blog post I have on glycemic load chart. So just type into Google Autumn Bates glycemic load and that one will pop right up. Now, the last thing I wanted to add about this section is shortening the fasting window. So with perimenopause and menopause in general, you do have much higher protein needs and protein is so satiating that you probably actually need to shorten how fast, how long your fast is. So if you're doing like an 18 hour fast, then you might want to drop that down to maybe even a 14 hour fast. In fact, for most women, um, especially in that perimenopause, menopause state, I'm finding a 14 hour fast is actually the most ideal length to still fit in all of the nutrient needs. So you have time in between each meal to actually get um, hungry again and therefore eat everything that you need. Katie, did you have something to say about that? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I think you were going to say something about shortening the fasting window when we talked about this. And then I just added it. That no, was perfect. Yeah. I just added it because I forgot that you're going to mention that. <laughs> Good. I'm glad it's there. Um, okay. So you're feeling too full for three meals. What should I do? This is kind of the opposite issue of the, like, I have an issue with snacking. What should I do? Um, if you're just starting your journey, it might seem odd. Like, how could I possibly feel too full to eat three meals? That doesn't seem like it's going to happen. But this actually is more common than you would think, because when you are eating the right types of foods to help boost the tidy and tell your brain you're full and you're satisfied, it can be difficult at times to actually fit in three meals. And we need those, we need to make sure we're eating enough during the eating window to actually support um, our muscle mass, our, the, micronutrients that we need to be getting in um, each day. So it's not just from a body recom recomposition perspective, but also from long term health perspective. Um, so again, going back to that first tip, widening the eating window a bit can be very helpful. So instead of going from a 16 hour fast, or maybe if you have an 18 hour fast, dropping it down to a 14 hour fast, or if even if you find just you are really full, and you just cannot fit all that food in that you need to support your body, dropping it to a 12 hour fast, even, even that 12 hour fast is going to give you some gut health um, benefits. So it's not going to have as long, uh, you know, as, as uh, the length of time is not going to be as long for the gut health perks, but you need to make sure that you're balancing out your food with your fast. For some people, maybe it's just a 12 hour fast for others. It could be 14 others. It could be 16. There could be a case for 18. Although I found generally between that 12, 16 range is more ideal. Um, so testing out widening your eating window so you can actually fit in those three meals. Now, assessing caffeine intake, again, is important. This is something that my mom and I just recently talked about because she was having two cups of coffee a day. She loves her coffee, but she'd sip on it throughout the whole morning and early afternoon. And so she just wasn't as hungry. She was eating much later because of that. And so she wasn't able to eat all of the nutrients to help support um, her goals. So she is looking to slightly increase muscle mass. So for her, we had to remove one of the cups of coffee so that she could actually naturally feel hungry um, and not keep suppressing that hunger. Caffeine is great. There's a lot of studied health benefits of drinking coffee and I love my coffee, but we need to, again, make sure that it's not suppressing your intake or your appetite so much that you're not able to get the nutrients to support your body's needs. So you could, if you're somebody who likes like two cups of coffee per day, try dropping it down to one. Um, and then you could switch to two meals. This isn't something I typically recommend. I usually recommend trying to address those first two things first. Uh, but if you are going to do this, then it is super important. You're not just removing a meal. So you're not just taking one full meal out and eating two meals instead, but instead you need to make sure you're still eating the same amount of protein, just split between two meals instead of three. So let's say you are trying to get about 
90 grams of protein per day, um, then you'll need to, instead of having the 30, 30, 30 split um, between your three meals, you'll need about 45 and 45. And then you can eat to satiety with the other components of your meals, uh, but you really need to make sure that you're at least getting the protein because that is going to be the most important factor for preventing muscle loss and making sure you have a healthy metabolism as well as all the other health benefits. Uh, and then again, don't have too much caffeine. Katie, I know you had something to say about this. <laughs> Um, I, I know as well, like another option, if you think you're just getting too full, let's say you have a little bit higher protein needs than 30 grams per meal. If you did the, the three meal split, um, you can also do like a little mini meal and just focus on the protein and kind of exactly what you said, then add in the fat and fiber components just to just enough to keep you satiated until you know, you're going to eat your, your bigger last meal of the day or second meal, however you, you structure it, but just having a little bit, um, and making that protein focus. And so that you're just, you're, you're not taking, you're not changing what you have to do in your lifestyle or whatever's going on, but you're focusing on that mini meal with protein. It just makes it a lot easier if two meals of just protein that are a little bit heavier and you still can't, you still feel too full to eat enough for your needs. Mm -hmm. It's really helpful. Yeah. Like for me personally. Yeah. Yeah. That is something I've used with a lot of different clients is this like two meal plus mini meal approach where you have um, like, let's say you just physically couldn't even eat that 45 grams at each meal. So instead we drop it down to like 35, 38 grams per meal. Then we get that extra 10 to 15 grams um, with this mini meal. So that could be like a chia pudding, a small um, chia pudding that uses like one and a half scoops of protein powder. So you're getting 15 grams of protein um, or, you know, it could be like the adult snack pack, which is something else that's from the programs as well. Um, and making sure that you're getting that 10 or 15 grams of protein to help bump it up a bit, but it's not a, a significantly big meal that it's going to make you too excessively full. Yeah. Okay. So I thought we could go through and answer a couple questions. I saw a couple good ones in the chat. Um, right now. But if you guys want to, we are in the last week of the spring challenge. But if you want to just get started on your journey, you could still grab the 21 day intermittent fasting program or the complete intermittent fasting bundle, which also includes seven day detox, which I mentioned earlier for the clean slate approach um, and the level up guide and thriving cookbook. All that's linked down description below if you guys want to check that out. But let's answer a couple questions. I saw Camille had a really good one I wanted to bring up. Okay, Camille. Hi, Camille. <laughs> um, why shouldn't we count collagen towards protein intake if we combine it with the complete protein? Is it different than combining incomplete plant proteins? So Camille asked this before we brought up the like combining um, plant proteins slide. So I think that helps to answer at least that last part. Um, but it's it is kind of similar in the sense where you technically could try and combine it with other sources of protein. Um, but it's just not going to provide, if you look at it on the diets, it actually is zero. Like it technically is zero diet score because it doesn't have these various amino acids. So it can't be absorbed and used as um, protein in the same way as other complete sources of protein. So I like to refer back to the diet score because it's the most current way that's the most accurate way to actually assess protein quality. It's not to say there is not a place for collagen. Collagen, um, you know, has a lot of really great health benefits. It's great for, especially for combining it with, with other complete proteins to then um, boost satiety even further. If you find that you are really struggling with satiety, there's studies on that showing really great benefits from gut health benefits, from joint health benefits, skin, hair, all of that, because we use collagen in so many different things. Um, but it is a zero diet score protein. So it's not one that it would be difficult to actually use it in a way you'd have to add in so many individual amino acids to actually make it a complete protein and use it as a protein. So I love collagen for what it is, but it's just not a complete protein. Anything you want to say, Katie? <laughs> no, I, I always view collagen or collagen supplements or even things which like pork rinds because I use them strategically in my pregnancy um, yes. for the glycine content. It, it's, uh, it, I just think of them as supplementing what I'm eating. I don't think of it as the protein and just having that change of play on things like collagen, I think is really helpful because then you're not relying on it as a source of protein. Definitely include it because like, as you're saying, it has a lot of added benefits, but don't view it as your sole source of protein, for example. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
Rachel. Hi, Autumn. Hello. I love working out with you and can't believe how good it feels working out in a fasted state. So much more stable energy. Do you ever recommend strength training twice a day to speed up results once in a fasted state and once in a fed around early afternoon? That's a good question. I, I think it's important to understand like what you're actually doing when you're strength training. You're sending a signal to your body that you need to repair those muscles. So the benefit of the workout isn't actually from the workout. It's from the recovery you get from that workout because you're sending this strong signal to your body like, oh, I'm using this muscle mass. We need to go recover it, make it stronger because the stimulus keeps happening. So we need to um, be prepared for needing to lift this heavy weight. So if you were to like do a, a two a day and do strength training um, twice in one day, especially if you aren't strategically adding in um, like rest and recovery, like an athlete, like if you're just focused on that, that's a different story. But if you are just somebody who is working out for body recomposition results, it's going to work against your goals because you're just going to keep tearing down your muscle during that workout and never allowing for the rest to actually recover. In fact, there's a, there's a lot of different, um, workout programs that are strength training focused that even only do like three days or even two days per week because they want to have so much recovery to actually allow for those muscles to recover and receive the benefits of that workout. So more is not more when it comes to workouts. Um, same thing with intermittent fasting. More is not more. We need to find the balance of like where we can get the most benefit out of each of these categories. So you still need to make sure you're getting the recovery with sleep, with not moving so much that you're going to um, hinder uh, the the results that you're getting with your muscle and also making sure you're getting the high quality nutrients to actually act as fuel to help your muscles recover and see the benefits. I think, um, yeah, because you're you're just starting, you're like restarting your strength training. Yeah, yes. training. Like what's the frequency you're doing right now? I, I'm at three to four days a week. Um, I know there's some like three days a week programs that just focus on full body, but it kind of yeah. goes back to what you're saying. Even three days a week of like doing full body for me personally was just, I wasn't getting enough recovery. Yeah. So I still kind of do a split where like I, I'll have like a leg day, a push day and a pull day. And yeah. then if I feel good, either, you know, in, in any of those days in between, if I feel like adding in, an additional uh, strength training workout or th that might be more core focused or like a little bit more hip focused. I'll, I'll do that, but that's really rare because I'm person, I just feel like still where I'm so new into strength training, I need a lot more recovery, um, especially to avoid injury, which I've had in the past. And that's something we don't, you don't you, personally, like, I feel like when we start our, strength training or um, fitness journey and adding in um, on top of, of the nutrition, you're excited, you want to do more, but you do have the mindset of more is better. But that really hasn't been my experience. So yeah, you know, you have to add in that that rest time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And in fact, I'm going to make yeah. it easier to see us. Okay. Um, in fact, like there are different ways you can split it up. Um, like what Katie was saying, it's like the traditional um, people call it like the bro split where it's like the upper body push, upper body pull, lower body push, lower body pull core. Um, or you could do total body. So if you were, if you were somebody who loves going to the gym, like I love going to the gym. So I like to split it up like that, where I have the upper body um, push on one day and then I have lower body push or pull, et cetera. Um, so that I can go to the gym that many days free. Cause I love it. I just like the feeling of being at the gym, it's like my happy place. Um, but if you don't like the gym as much, then you could do total body, but you're going to need to limit the amount of days you're going so you can get the rest in between. Mm -hmm. So that might be like only two or possibly three days. Yeah, Definitely not like two days <laughs> or two, twice in one day. Uh, okay. Um, now this might've been before we talked about this, but I wanted to bring this one up in case Somebody who's watching this is like brand new to the channel and doesn't know the philosophy. So uh, Sasha, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. But what would being in a calorie deficit look like? So if you're purely going with the eat less, move more, which is what calorie deficit is, what the main focus with eat less, move more strategy is, is just a simple calorie deficit and not focusing on like the hormonal impacts on the body or where that um, weight loss is coming from. That typical strategy can result in a lot of muscle loss, um, which ultimately lowers the metabolism and you have to keep eating less 
as a result. So people who are using this typical strategy of weight loss, maybe they drop their calories and it's like 1600 calories per day to begin with. They experience some weight loss, um, they're feeling great. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I'm not losing weight. In fact, I'm actually starting to gain weight even though I'm tracking really diligently. Um, and I don't know what's happening. So then they drop it down a little bit more. It's like, okay, let's drop down to 1400 calories. They break through that plateau. They start to lose a little bit more weight. Again, they're looking at the wrong measurements. They're just looking at the scale. They're not looking at in body, which in body would probably tell you you're losing a lot of muscle mass, not body fat. And then they experience another plateau. And then they have to drop it down again by another 200 calories or so. And so it's a stepwise approach. And eventually just you have to physically eat. The body needs to be eating something to get nourishment. Um, so you can only go down so low until now just the metabolism is instead of being up here, it's way down here. And you need you are now stuck with eating like at this maintenance of like a thousand calories per day and still not achieving your goals. And in fact, if you go up to twelve hundred, now you are actually gaining weight. So this is why we do not go about the strategy of just simple eat less, move more, um, because it's first of all, it's not pleasant. It's not pleasant to feel hungry, um, but it just doesn't work with our body. It works against our body. Instead, we can actually feel satiated, um, naturally give our body what it is looking to eat and the nourishment it needs and raise the proper satiety hormones to feel full and satisfied so that then we can naturally just eat what our body needs. And then we're able to tap into internal um, fat as fuel instead. So it's a little bit of oversimplification. I have a video um, that dives a lot more deep into this. If you are brand new to my channel, and if this idea of not counting calories for weight loss, it seems so foreign. We have so many people in the private Facebook group who can assure you like there's a lot of great results that can be had with this when you are doing it the right way, or you can check out stories on my blog as well. You can click the little, little testimonials tab and see a lot of different stories, a lot of food freedom that goes along with that. Um, but I do have a video that uh, dives a little bit into this. I forget the title of it, but it's something about calories. I very rarely use calories in the title of my um, video. So if you just go on my channel and use a search function and type calories, that one will probably pop up. Anything you want to say about that, Katie? Yeah, we have a few good videos over calories and macros for um, on YouTube if anyone needs to refresh. Yes, I I think I also have that. Oh, well, that's the counting carbs one, which is a little different. Um, but I was thinking of doing one on specifically why I don't count macros, which that might be coming soon as well. OK, I'm going to try and answer like one more question here. Um. Yeah, here's Rachel said, vegan didn't work for me either, resulted in excess hair shedding. Greek yogurt, eggs, cottage cheese, grass-fed ground beef, and canned tuna and salmon gave life back to my hair. I noticed that as well. That was something um, I'd lost a lot of hair when I was more plant-based. And now I have super thick hair. <laughs> I have too much hair. <laughs> um, okay. What is your favorite healthy snack? So there is a time and a place for a snack. You could call it mini meal. You call it snack kind of like very, they overlap a lot. Um, but if you do find like, especially if in the beginning, um, when you are first transitioning away from grazing all day and having the three meal structure instead, if you find that you haven't quite hit that uh, sweet spot yet where you are able to make it to the next meal um, without feeling hungry for about four hours and you do find you need a little snack, the best options are those that are primarily focused on protein. So some of my favorite just like grab and go options that you can find like even at gas stations now are like the beef sticks or beef jerky. Those are really great. I think they even have like turkey sticks and I think there's even salmon ones. I've now. seen the salmon. Yeah. I'm not sure how to do it. They must be popular because I've seen them pop up yeah. quite a bit. Um, that would be great. A little bit like a the single serve of cottage cheese. So you're not getting too full, um, but you're getting some protein. Because what happens with protein is it does actually raise our satiety hormones and tells our brain we're full, we're satisfied, we don't need to eat. If you were to have like a typical type of snacky food item, like let's say pretzels um, or even just nuts, which nuts is a healthy item, but it is just primarily fat and very little protein. Um, if you're to have either of those, either spectrum, whether it be the higher fat, low protein or higher carb, low protein, um, both of them don't raise the satiety hormones enough. So we end up just eating more and more and more and more and get into this snacking spiral. And again, eat beyond our body's needs. So you need to have that protein be the central focus um, of a snack. So that could be like beef jerky, um, cottage cheese, Greek yogurt, the plant-based Greek yogurt is a good option, hard boiled eggs, egg bites, any other thoughts? Hard boiled eggs are like, I feel like 
when I travel, I mean that you can find those so easy everywhere. Yeah. It's they're easy, you know, it's easy, it's not messy. And yeah, those are kind of our go-to, me and my exactly. husband. Or even hard cheeses are great because they are pretty easy to transport. Um, and they're a lot higher in protein than like the softer cheeses. Parm I think it's Parmesan has about nine or 10 grams of protein per ounce. It's actually very high. Which uh, I don't know if you've seen this. I don't mean to interrupt, but it's the coolest mm -hmm. thing. I was at the grocery store and they had little parm cubes. Like, really? I don't know if you're familiar with like the baby bell cheeses, yeah. like little individual pre-wrapped cheeses. I saw like a bag of pre-wrapped, like nine gram portioned of uh, like one ounce servings, I guess, of Parmesan. I've never seen that before. So that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. No. yeah. I haven't seen that either, but if you can find that, that's a great sign. <laughs> um, so just focus on the high diets, high protein sources. You don't need to eat like a 30 grams worth. Just get like 10, 15 grams worth, like the snack size servings. Like the beef sticks are usually about nine or 10 grams. Mm -hmm. So you can have like one or two of those. Um, and that would be a better focus so that you are getting a little bump in those satiety hormones rather than just being able to eat like well beyond our body's needs because we're not getting the satiety hormones raised from these other typical snacky food items. Okay, guys, <laughs> as you can probably hear, I'm starting to lose my voice from talking so long. Um, but thank you so much for tuning in. This is week three of the spring intermittent fasting challenge. Um, so this is the last week. And then make sure you submit your story this weekend. We have the blog post coming out this Friday where you can share your story, um, share your experience and be entered in to win a lot of different grand prizes. A lot of great ones this uh, spring. Um, so make sure you stay on the lookout for that. We also have a Monday email coming out um, that will have the details for how to submit your story there. So stay tuned. Um, but this has been a really fun challenge. I'm really glad that Katie got to come on and share her experience as well. She has great insight. So thank you, Katie. Of course. Thanks for having me. It's been fun. Yeah. 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 And happy um, week three to everyone as well and the community. Yes. Yeah. And we have the summer intermittent fasting challenge coming up really soon and a brand new meal plan. Katie's actually been looking it over. I just finished it and very I'm excited. excited. <laughs> it's, I, I'm, I'm stoked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So lots, lots of new recipes, lots of new information, especially focused on body recomposition. So stay tuned for that. But otherwise, guys, thanks so much for tuning in and we'll see you again really soon.